This week on CrossFeed. Can you be an atheist Catholic teacher? Are your pastor's sermons laughable? Vouchers, vouchers, get your vouchers. Christian ballet. And Democrats and faith. Hello, everyone, and welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio. I'm Pastor Jim Butler, out here in beautiful Dedham, Massachusetts, currently sitting in my half-done kitchen. Does it look awful? They don't pay him well enough. He can't even put so- um, outlets in his sockets, and, and, and he's got no paint on his walls. Poor guy. Yeah, well, last week I didn't even have walls, so I'm, I'm, I'm ahead than I was Ooh, last week. Right? You got a raise. They give you walls. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I put them all up myself, so we, we got them up, though. A month ago, he was living in a cardboard box. <laughs> yeah. No, I wasn't. I was living in my car, my truck. <laughs> so, oh. well, I just got done. With our um, our Bible study on Esther, mm. and, which we started this week, and um, and and so we we did the the live streaming thing, and we did have two people uh, watching us online. Uh, didn't get any comments, but um, so I have no idea who they were. If it's any of our um, viewers, let me know, um, and invite anybody. At Seven o'clock Eastern time. Uh, on Sunday evenings, we're going to continue it. And if you want to get caught up, if you want to catch uh, what we already did, uh, you can just go to shepherdtheridge.org and find Esther, and uh, and the it's it's recorded there, so you can watch it. And uh, I did some some interesting. We looked at the um, th- this week. We looked at the the arguments against the historicity uh, of the Book of Esther, and um, and and work through those and. Uh, we also looked at, uh, there's a Luther quote um, where he has some really nasty things to say about Esther. And I did some research, and I found out that that quote is usually misquoted. Mm. And so I'm not going to say any more, but instead I'll encourage you to go over to shepherdtheridge.org and, and check it out and um, and just go watch the first episode there. And and you can find out about that. So. Somewhere along the line, I read that when I did my Bible study in Esther, that the banquet he was having and that stuff were Vashti, uh, and he's really, you know, just, he's really upset and angry and everything. That all takes place around the time of the movie 300. That was when he was uh, going to war against those Greeks and got re- repulsed. Oh, yeah, I never, yeah, you're right. I never made that connection that that was yep. him. And see, I didn't see 300. I heard it was really good, but I haven't seen it. Yeah, I didn't like it. <laughs> well, I heard it was good. If you, what I heard was, it's not much on plot, but if you like a good action movie, it had lots of action. I yeah, nah. I don't know. Hey, let's 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 get in and talk about uh, where, where where should we begin? Well, talking about entertainment, let's talk about ballet. A little different. From, okay. Uh, from 300. Um, uh, we've got a group f- from Jackson, Mississippi. Um, they're called uh, Ballet Magnificat. <coughs> and they started in 1986. Uh, their founder is Kathy Thibodeau. hope I'm pronouncing that right. It's the nation's first Christian ballet company. And when she started it, they're they're celebrating, oh, what is it? 25 well, years. Yeah. Or 26 so, years. Yeah, 1986. So um, so this is, this is an article about this. I thought this was kind of interesting. Um, it says, when they, when they first got started, people told them it was a big mistake. Uh, fellow dancers warned them that it's hard enough to keep a mainstream troupe afloat, let alone one with such a specialized focus. Her church friends told her that dance and Christian ministry don't mix. Ballet is immodest, too flashy, too sensual. In the company's early years, the dancers would get letters telling them that what they were doing was wrong, that the devil was using dancing to provoke licentiousness and immorality. 
So they point okay. to Psalm 149 and 150. Yeah, well, yeah, I don't say David danced before the Lord. Also, see, I know it's interesting that it's supposed to be an evangelical Christian group because Magnificent, of course, is Mary's song. Right. And, you know, so it's, it's a kind of a liturgical term there. So I think it's interesting that, that, which, by the way, of course, brings the idea that, there, that there's, a, there's a history of dance in the church. There's a history of a liturgical dance in the church. Mm-hmm. Uh, people don't realize that. Uh, but, uh, uh, I, you know, I've had the experience of seeing two, uh, a couple churches that use liturgical dance. It's a really cool thing. So, I mean, I don't like ballet personally, but I think it's cool as, as an outreach to people who enjoy it. You know, you, although I, I appreciate the athleticism of the, of the dancers. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of work. Not that I have experience in it. I was born with a, um, with two left feet. <laughs> And I actually went out, you know, all the, the swing choir stuff that's so popular now because of Glee. I, when I was in high school, I tried out for a swing choir and, uh, I had the voice for it, but not the steps. And, uh, I was one of two people that didn't make it <laughs> and we didn't that's have okay. a maximum number either. <laughs> I didn't have a voice and I didn't have the dance steps either. So no, no voice, no rhythm. Uh, but I think it's kind of cool. This is that they, they've toured all around the world, uh, but they did a, um, uh, a Holocaust thing ballet, The Hiding Place, about Corrie Ten Boom. Uh, that was pretty cool. She's always been one of my heroes. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, it says that they are, the the author of this article says, I don't know of any other company that exclusively performs original works, most of them full-length story ballets. Um, they've done The Scarlet Chord about underground missionaries saving souls in communist Russia or Deliver Us, a whirlwind mashup of the Moses and Jesus stories. Think Ten Commandments meets the Rockettes nativity scene. So that's cool. I mean, that, that'd be really... Now, I, okay, I've heard a lot of criticism of especially liturgical dance um, in, in a service because it doesn't have words. And, and the gospel is communicated through words. But I, I don't know. I, I think that you could, you could, uh, communicate. I mean, I've watched ballets and, and, um, usually you get a little, you know, in your program or whatever, sort of explanation of what's going on and a sort of rough plot synopsis. Mm-hmm. And if they're doing stories from the Bible, well, not completely stories from the Bible, if they're doing stories about missionaries or Cory Ten Boom, but, um, you know, if you if you kind of have a general idea of what's going on, watching the dance mm-hmm. will sort of fill in the rest of the story, and and it's pretty easy to follow. I don't know. At the times I've heard the liturgical seeing liturgical dance, it's always been to me words. Uh, I've seen Jerry Coleman's "The Lamb." Um, I've seen two or three other songs. So there were some. At uh, one time, it was to, to to music that you would know. Uh, one time, it was to "Were You There." Yeah. Um. And I mean, so the words were there in terms of the the hymnody, in the words of the song. Uh, but we're in trouble. You froze again. No, you froze. I didn't freeze. Oh, okay. Um, but uh, okay. But here's the thing: Can you do the dance and make jokes at the same time? Hmm. Hold on. Before, wait, before we get into that, one other thing that, that I thought was worth pointing out, a couple other things, actually. Uh, first of all, they um, they have a hard time getting men. And and given that all of these stories in the Bible pretty much have at least one man in them, um, because they're they're pretty strict about you've got to be um, you've got to be a Christian. And, uh, you've got to be an evangelical Christian. Well, they had, they said they had one Catholic one time, but things just didn't work out. Um, they have pretty strict code of conduct in that. So, you know, most of the, um, most of the, it's, it's hard to find a straight evangelical Christian man, um, who is interested in performing pretty much full time in a ballet troupe. And, uh, and so they run into some choreography problems with that when you can't get men. Um, and one other thing is they talked about the clothing, um, you know, because generally ballet costumes are, um, somewhat immodest, um, you know, the tutus and things like that that show a lot of skin. And, um, they said that they have, 
No uh, classical tutus. Skirts typically extend below the knees, and under them the women wear dark leggings on top of flesh-colored tights. And the men wear pants, not tights. So I thought that was a good idea. If you're, you know, if you're going to be working with churches, then you just take care of that whole modesty issue. Sure. So, no, wait, 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 wait a minute. You said that they, they, they you have to be a uh, uh, evangelical Christian to be in the group. They had a Catholic one that didn't work, right? I think that's what it said. Would, yeah. Yeah. Would an atheist answer work? Ah, <laughs> go in that direction. Nope, no agnostics, um, which is pretty similar to a tr- a school in Des Moines. Oh, Fort Dodge, sorry. Yeah. Back by yeah, my Fort old Fort Dodge ground. Catholic School. Oh, um, there's a woman, Abby Noor. She's 26 years old, my daughter's age. And uh, she was hired last August to teach math. And she was fired in December because um, she um, had joined about joined a a uh, social network group called Atheist ne- ne- Nexus, the site for non theists. And on her uh, Facebook page, she put down that she didn't believe in God. Yeah, yeah. There was a question. You know, they have those sort of personal question things on Facebook, um, and it said. Uh, 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 truths, a hundred truths, and it said, "Do you believe in God?" And she said, "No." So now the article really—it seems like it really focuses on her joining this group, this atheist nexus um, website, which um, and uh, said so during her unemployment hearing, the school's business manager testified that um, she would violated the principles of the Catholic Church by joining atheist nexus. Um, he says she should be denied unemployment benefits for being a member of the athe- of an atheist website. And to that, I said, no. All right. Because I signed up at an atheist website not all that long ago because I wanted to, um, I wanted to, to discuss an issue that, that they were talking about on there. The, we've actually mentioned it before, the friendly atheist, um, you know, they were talking about some stuff and I wanted to chime in there. So I signed up there because you have to sign up to, you know, to post comment or whatever. And, um, so this doesn't mean that I agree with their position or anything. I just was interested in talking there. So I I don't think that, that joining in, an online community necessarily means that you're in agreement with that community. You know, they're all about dialogue and, Unless they specifically have a, you know, there's there's some groups where where they have a, a statement of faith where they say this is what we believe and you can only be a part of this if you say yes, this is what I believe. But yeah, when she specifically said, you know, do you believe in God? No. I got a bad feeling about this. Well, okay. that's something well, else. Yeah, but you know what? Number one, they should have dealt with that before they hired her. Okay, so mm-hmm. when she was interviewed, they asked if she was Catholic. She said no. Okay, they, you know, they didn't say, "Do you believe in God at all?" You know, maybe they should, you know, gone to real basic stuff there, or what church are you a part of, or you know, kind of, I don't know, explored that more than the way that they did. Um, that and she's apparently more of an agnostic. She says, "I'm not an atheist. I'm not a Catholic. I'm not a Christian. I'm somewhere in between." You know, so she, you know, would do the liturgy and do the prayers and the mass services there at the school. She didn't argue about that. Um, you know, and, and I'm sitting there just kind of looking at this going, you know, um, okay, she's not teaching religion. But so long as she said, I'm going to teach math and only math and otherwise kept her mouth shut about what she did or didn't believe. Um, you know, realizing, okay, I'm in a Catholic school. They're going to teach religion and stuff. I don't believe it, but I'm not going to argue the point. You know, I'm not going to sit there and say I disagree with you people or I'm not going to say anything to the students about it. Um, that I wouldn't have a problem with her doing it as long as she just stays, you know, in her subject area. Yeah, yeah I, although if depending, you know, she says she doesn't know how people found out because she did it on her Facebook page. I'd say, lady, check your privacy settings. <laughs> right. But, um, you know, I, I think that if if she has even 
even through something like this, made a public statement that she doesn't believe in God, I would say that she's undermining, you know, the message of the church. And I mean, the simple reality is you post something on Facebook, it's public because, you know, it may be that somebody else in the community saw this and went, huh? You know, and then mentioned it to the church. It says it's accessible to designated friends. It can be a friend to a friend, you know, type of thing that, that, that gets around. Mm-hmm. Um, that's true. I mean, but I, you know, when I was at Concordia, Missouri, I'm looking back, you know, there's, there's some of my teachers that back there and stuff, and I wonder, you know, um, um, like our driver's ed teacher, I wonder if he was Christian at all. I, you know, I really don't know. Uh, you know, he went to, you know, he went to chapel. Um, he, he raised, but I know he would, you know, I don't know how often went to church on the weekends or anything because he, um, uh, was a part time race car driver. And, um, you know, when, when he was, uh, when they hired him, he even said that the guy told him and said, um, I would think somebody with your qualification would want, you know, something more full time. We, we can't offer that. And driver said here, and he's like, Oh no, I just want something part time actually because I race cars on the weekends. Um, and he was a great guy. I mean, he was, you know, he's a, he was an awesome driver's ed teacher, uh, awesome person to know, and did some nice, did some really good stuff with us. But I had, but you know, he never talked about what he believed or what he didn't believe. Well, I think that they need to. The school needs to decide what their, um, what their rules are. Uh, like for instance, our preschool. You've got to be a Christian. You, you, you have to, you know, we're not going to check on your church attendance or anything like that. You don't have to be a member of our congregation. But if you want to be a preschool teacher here, we ask you if you're a Christian, you need to say yes. All right. We'll take you at your word. But, um, but you're teaching Christianity to the kids. Now, it's a little different from being a math teacher. All right. Where you're specialized in that one area. Um, our, you know, our preschool teachers are teach a, a broader curriculum than that, um, being a preschool and, and the Christian teachings are a part of that. And, you know, and I'd like to see Christian teaching sort of integrated wherever possible. Now with drivers at, I don't know, you know, how much and, and math, um, uh, not so much either. Once, unless you get, you know, real deep into it, there's some, you, you hit some interesting mathematical concepts where people have pointed to some of those concepts in like intelligent design arguments and stuff like that. Um, well, then there is my son's uh, math curriculum that they went to, and I can't remember who published it. The school was using, but it, you know, it had stuff in there. I, I thought it was a lot. You know, a lot of it was like. Um, uh, Tommy wants to give eighteen uh, percent uh, of his money to the mission to to a uh, supportive missionary. This month he earned this much. This month, how much did he send to the missionary altogether? <laughs> <laughs> I I just thought, oh my goodness, come on! Well, yeah, they're really trying there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was, there's a few others that were just like. <gasps> Oh boy, we're hmm, we're really stretching here, huh? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it just that kind of stuff thrown in. But um, I mean, I don't know. I, you know, maybe she made the mistake of putting on herself her Facebook page. But it seems to me the school had the responsibility to talk to her about what she did or didn't believe when they hired her. Yeah, I, I think that you know, I, I can see it from both sides. I can see it from the school's perspective. But at the same time, I can see it from her perspective. You know, yeah, the the school should have asked her. You know, if right. if they have something in writing, they should have said, "Look, this is our policy." You know, and as a religious school, they have the right to hire based on your religion for mm-hmm. faculty, not staff. Now, you can't you can't choose not to hire a janitor because of his religion, um, but for faculty, you can. That was something that, um, I think, because that was what KFUO, the Lutheran radio station, ran into a number of years ago, um, because they were hiring, uh, like janitors and things like that, um, based on the, they were asking about their religion. They got sued, uh, for, for those support positions. They said, yeah, uh, they actually won that lawsuit though. Oh, did they? Because, yeah, because the, the rule, yeah, because that should be under the, the, the religious organization to say. 
Okay. Um, because I was a jan- I was a janitor in a Lutheran school. Um, you know, and I would, you know, talk to the students. Now, the other two guys who were janitors there were not Christian, and boy, I tell you, if they, um, uh, that their language and stuff was horrible, and I just thought, often thought, I said, you know, yeah, but, yeah. And they, I mean, I, and they pretty much, near as I could tell, hated the students, so. Mm. <laughs> but, uh, that was beside the point. Anyway, so. I don't know. Maybe maybe this teacher just needs more humor. Maybe. Right. So, uh, pastors, pastors urge to put the ha in hallelujah. Uh, it's from USA Today. And uh, talking about the uh, push to add more jokes to sermons. Um, so, do you put jokes in sermons, Jim? No. You don't at all? I do not put jokes. I use humor in sermons. But I think there's a difference between humor and a joke. Okay. You know, I do. I, do. I think, you know, I mean, today I was talking. I said, yeah, okay, you should put your name on your paper. Put your name on your underwear. You know, on camp, you know. And, you know, that's okay. They laugh. But there's a very once in a while. But, you know, I think a joke is a very special type of humor because there's a setup and everything that you're attempting to do that has a punchline. Whereas I think you can use a lot of humor that's just things that are just funny. Okay. You know, without telling jokes necessarily. Do you ever use a joke as an illustration? Obscure joke. Talk to your parents. Might have once or twice, but um problem is, is um, you know, if if you don't have the right group, um, then, you know, a joke can really fall flat. Or, you know, I mean, I've had a couple times and did something and it's just like, you know, feel like I was out there, rust, you know, in the... You know, crickets. <laughs> crickets, yeah, there's crickets. Okay, well, that went fell flat. Um you know, sometimes, uh, but generally I, I like to use, na- you know, humor that's kind of natural. Mm-hmm. You know, just stuff that's just, just kind of funny. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's kind of what I do too. Um, I, I, I see a lot of irony in things. Like this morning I was talking about, you know, Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. And so they, you know, they tried to stone him. And, and I was talking about how, you know, that, at different times they, they tried to, to corner him in, in arguments and, and stuff like that. And, um, and you know, when all else fails, throw a rock at him. And, and that got some laughs and, um, you know, and, but it was just sort of, you know, these guys were at their wits end. And so that's what they did. And I just thought it was kind of funny. Like, well, <laughs> this isn't working. <laughs> we're just going to throw a rock at him, you know, which actually, and then, you know, I explained that that was actually what he said, was you know what they're they're accusing him of blasphemy and that actually you know stoning was the punishment for blasphemy so um, right but but uh, no I mean you know I I don't know she you know she says that uh, this is from this woman pastor Susan Sparks she says we think we've erred too much on the weeping side um, I I agree with it you know that humor helps you connect that humor can diffuse um, the situation that you know. Uh, humor can definitely make uh, what you're preaching go down a little bit easier. Mm-hmm. You know, but I think, on the other hand, telling jokes, it, you know, I've heard some sermons that were just like one joke after another. Right, right. And it's like, is this, uh, you know, is this a sermon or is this Jay Leno's monologue, you know? All right. That's funny. Why is that funny? So, I don't know. And, you know, I think you got to find that balance. And and you always have to sort of ask the question, what am, who am I highlighting here? You know, am I highlighting Jesus or am I highlighting myself? And I always kind of worry about. I, I heard this quote um, last week, and it was, um, "It's more important to be clear than to be clever." And you know, the the point is the message. And um and and I always sort of anytime I do something that's you know, that I think is sort of clever, whether it be a, a unique illustration or something like that. I always worry that people are going to kind of latch onto the illustration and then not get the point of it. And then, and they're going to remember the illustration, but they're not going to remember, you know, they remember the symbol, but they don't remember what it symbolizes. Right. And that does happen, but I think she's got some good stuff in here. You know, first, the first on things is, is edit, edit, edit. 
You know, preachers have a bad habit of never getting the point. There's times I've said this morning I was preaching and I thought, you know, even during the sermon, I was like, you know, this paragraph isn't necessary. <laughs> you know, I just, I just skipped it. I said, you know, the, the times you, you look at it, you, you know, you just got to ask yourself, does it, you know, does it need to be there? Because the other part I liked is, um, we're preaching to people raised on sound bites. You have to ask, is this relevant to the message? Will they remember it? Mm-hmm. Again, that's absolutely true. You know, in the soundbite culture, you need to come up with stuff that, you know, short little pithy things that really do, you know, hone in on stuff. I mean, I read sermons, um, <clears throat> and I mean, some of them are wonderful doctrinal treatises, but I don't think there's anything that would, gra- you know, I, that would grab me. I, I remember reading one this week, and I wanted to really write to the guy and said, you know, the, the way you begin this, there's just nothing there to grab my attention. You know, my son's English teacher used to talk about the big grabber. You know, you, you know, well, wow, what are you going to do to grab the people in? And there, there was nothing there that, that grabbed me. And just like, okay, this is, this is starts out dull and it doesn't get any better, does it? <laughs> yeah, I actually, um, I have a, a little clip that I keep on my computer desktop, um, for just as sort of an introductory uh, thing that this is actually from a third grade, uh, teacher. Who said, um, you know, for, to avoid a boring beginning, if you want to kind of grab people's attention at the beginning, either start out with some dialogue, um, or some sort of sound effect, you know, boom, or you know, whatever, um, or some sort of action, some high energy thing that, where people want to know what happened next, you know, and I don't necessarily follow that all the time. But if I'm looking for an idea for, you know, how can I start this where I can get people's attention, uh, a lot of times I'll, I'll refer back to those points. So, you know, and, and again, it's the whole point is to, to point people to Jesus, not to you as a preacher. Um, and, uh, and, and I, man, I, I constantly worry about that. And, <clears throat> but, to you know, you want to, you want to convey the message you want to, and you want um, well, you also recognize that the Holy Spirit can work, uh, in spite of us, but I always, you know, my prayers always keep me out of the way, you know? Right. Well, I think that's always the key thing. And, you know, that, that our illustrations, I, it's very key that the, you don't let the illustra- illustrations overwhelm the message. They have to serve it. I preach you the difficult thing to do. And, uh, but I, I liked a lot of what she had to say there. Yeah. Um, I like the, so, it said, for those who say God's not funny, um, said all they have to do is open the Bible, take the Old Testament story of Sarah giving birth in her 90s. Whoever heard of his obstetrics being covered by Medicare? Right. I mean, that's a good line. It's not a joke, no. but it's a good line. You know, yeah. it's, it's something that's going to get people to laugh, you know, or, uh, uh, um, you know, I think Max Lucado used the line, uh, you know, they were the first couple in the, um, First couple in the nursing home, they need a bassinet. <laughs> oh, and um, and she also says that you can turn your mistakes into opportunities to connect with the congregation. On Easter Sunday, our big Easter, not the um, the uh, sunrise service that's not nearly as well attended, but our you know our packed Easter Sunday service. Mm-hmm. And when I was and we were using a special service that day. And so I had it, you know, on paper in front of me, two of the pages stuck together. And I didn't realize it. And I was trying to figure out what's going on as I, you know, skipped <laughs> basically two pages worth of stuff. And actually, when I realized it, I just stopped and I went, I skipped a whole bunch, didn't I? <laughs> and everybody goes, uh-huh. <laughs> of all the times to do it. I've got to do it on Easter Sunday, you know, and everybody got a chuckle out of it. We went back to, you know, where we were supposed to leave off and everything was fine, you know. And uh, so it, it was a nice way to sort of, like, I was just horribly embarrassed, but, um, you know, it was, everybody just went, oh, yep, he's human. And, you know, sort of just sort of made it something positive by everybody you know, was already in a pretty good mood and, and everyone got a little chuckle out of it and, you know, and then we just kept on going. So. Yep. So. <clears throat> well, now this woman was teaching, this atheist teacher was at a uh, uh, Catholic school. I wonder if any of the kids were there on vouchers. 
Okay. <clears throat> All right. So um, now shifting uh, south a bit to Arizona, uh, we have this. This is a subject that's an ongoing question, um, ongoing debate about. Uh, all right. Can you if if you're not going to send your kids to the public schools, can you get a um, a voucher, tax credit, you know, something like that, for sending them? Um, if they have something for private schools, um, what if that private school is a religious school? You know, people like you are the reason I was afraid to go to school as a child. So, so this is uh, the U.S. Supreme Court hearing a case on their um, tax credits for donations toward private school scholarships. Right. Now, th- now okay, this is this is the, okay. This is a very complicated plan. The state gives a tax credit to individuals who donate to nonprofit entities that award scholarships for children to attend private schools, including religious schools. So it's not a deduction, it's a credit. But if I give it to another organization, so I give it to Scholarships Are Us, a nonprofit organization, parents apply to Scholarships Are Us, and they get a scholarship to attend a Catholic school or a Lutheran school. That is the problem. Or a Jewish school, for that matter. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, there is nothing, there is no government money here. Right. You know, per se. Except the um, tax credit. Except the tax credit. Um, Now, uh, and so that's that's the way it's going. Um, It's a very complicated thing. Uh, now, so the ACLU um, filed the original lawsuit, right. and they said it's unconstitutional because it amounts to state endorsement of religion. Right. Um, and the Ninth Circuit agreed. Well, we're dealing with the Ninth Circuit uh, um, now. They we okay. To which George will he um, commented on this case? I I really like this. He said. Um, this week, the Supreme Court should spank the Ninth Circuit again and ask, is it too much to ask you that you pay some attention to our precedents? <laughs> <laughs> because they ruled on this, you know, in 2002, in a case in Cleveland, where um, the school district in Cleveland uh Flunked 27 out of 27 standards measuring students' performance. The state declared an academic emergency, and the parents were allowed to redeem publicly funded vouchers at religious as well as non-religious private schools. And uh, in uh, an opinion written by Rehnquist and joined by O'Connor, Scalia, Kennedy, and Thomas, they held the courts. The court held the Cleveland's program had a valid secular purpose of helping children who are trapped in failing schools for which Cleveland was responsible. The court held the program satisfied the court's previously enunciated standard of true private choice because government aid goes to parents who use the money unfettered at their discretion. See, what it comes down uh, to is, as long as the whatever school they're sending their kid to is meeting whatever the educational standards are, all right, they've got to learn these points. All right, and and like Ohio has graduation tests that they use as to um to determine whether the kids are learning those points or not. And so um okay, if the kids are going to a private school, regardless what else they're learning at that school, as long as they are learning the required information then it doesn't matter what else they're learning there the other issue is you know i mean from the other side of the thing is that you know uh, i always get a little worried about state money because it generally comes with strings attached Mm -hmm. you know and um so you know we've always kind of struggled against that uh, as Lutherans, uh, but I think, and in, in, you know, if it's if it's a straight voucher program, the state says, you know, you've got here's the money, you've got the. In this case, it's not even state; it's a nonprofit organization. Here's mm-hmm. the money, go spend it on whatever school you think is best for your kid for whatever reason. 
have a good time. Um, you know, uh, and I'm sure there are certain academic qualifications they have to fulfill in order to continue to, to get that scholar, that that scholarship money going their way. Mm-hmm. But no, the yeah, the, the ninth core circuit, however, are slow learners. George Will just thought they should have the Supreme Court. He was arguing for just a summary reversal, you know, uh, just like you know, re reverse and that's it, and just um, so. Yeah. All right. So, but maybe the problem is they're Democrats. <laughs> yeah, that they are. <laughs> um, and uh, well, this was this was interesting. Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, in two thousand eight, the Democrat Democratic Party did a very careful outreach to churches and to religion faith based organizations, and hired some faith consultants, and advertised regularly on Christian radio. Uh, had candidates who uh, spoke openly about their relationship with God, um, particularly Catholics, uh, particularly the guys in Democrats for Life. Um, and now, you know, they've gone from a half dozen uh, faith staff to uh, one part-time slot. Uh, it's Faith Issues website, you know, uh, had, uh, this was from on May 24th, you know, I still had greetings from Passover and Rosh Hashanah. And, and yeah, those are the big things, not even, uh, Christmas or Easter. Or anything. Right. So, yeah. Um, and they also talked about, uh, some different organizations that help, uh, political parties and political candidates with faith issues. They're sort of consultants that had, were getting a lot of business, um, back in 08. And, uh, since then they've gotten nothing. Are you a God fearing man, Senator? And, uh, so they've, the, the Patrick McKenna spokesman for the Pennsylvania Democratic Party said, I think this econo- in this economic climate, feel like people are in some ways moving away from that kind of conversation. In other words, people would rather talk about the economy than, you know, gay rights, abortion, you know, all the sort of moral issues that, um, that are specifically seen as, uh, religious issues. Mm-hmm. Um, now, oh, and, um, uh, so when Obama took office, he made a point of expanding the faith office established by President George W. Bush, which includes branches in a dozen federal agencies and a core staff that communicates with faith leaders about policy issues. Office's director, James Dubois, uh, declined to comment on democratic political outreach, but said the White House is in frequent contact with faith leaders, a key way to stay connected to religious voters. I thought that was interesting that he expanded uh, that office because Bush took a lot of heat um, for that office and, and Obama came in and, and actually expanded it. And I don't know, you don't hear a lot about that. Well, of course not. That. It's their guy doing it now. Yeah, I guess. You know, I mean, I mean, you know, they're t- you know, I mean, come on, let's be honest. We have a huge oil spill in the Gulf. If, if George Bush had been in office, Democrats in Congress have been screaming, calling him incompetent, uh, calling for his head. The press would have been doing the same. But this is their guy. So they want to, you know, treat him with kid gloves. Uh, there's a couple of things, you know, uh, the same thing with this offer made to C-Stack, you know, to drop out of the race. Had that been a, a, a had had that been happened during the Bush administration, again the Democrats in Congress would have gone crazy, calling for a special prosecutor to investigate and get the truth out. Um, there's something else. I mean, it was you know, but you, you, they protect their own. Yeah, it works both ways. Yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, it works the same way. I mean, yeah, you know, the you know the Bush administration probably need to be high, called to a higher account in some areas, but because Republicans are in Congress, control Congress most of the time, they didn't. Um, and so, you know, we, they, they, they tend to, you know, uh, protect their own on both sides. And that's a real, that's a real sad thing, in my opinion, uh, that, you know, uh, integrity seems to depend on, you know, which party happens to be in power. Uh, you always want the integrity when the other guys are in power, not when you are. Yeah. Uh, 
I keep but hoping I think to see a change with that. <laughs> yeah, I, I <laughs> do too. Optimistic. But I think that's one of the things that, that, that you know, I don't know. On the other hand, I, I look at this story and I kind of like, um, do how much does religion and politics mix? I mean, you know, we had the guy, where was it, in Indiana? You know, this evangelical Christian, you know, did this abstinence uh, uh, video having an affair with the staffer that he did the abstinence video with. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, you know, that's a lot of the, you know, the people that are big proponents of traditional marriage and then, um, but they're, you know, on their third marriage, <laughs> you know, right. or, or, or something like that. Or, or you get the, um, you know, the, the Republicans going into the lesbian strip bar and, you know, and things like that. And it's just like, oh, you know, <laughs> You, you gotta walk the walk too. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, that's just it. I mean, I, I believe you can be Christian and Democrat. You can be Christian and Republican. Mm -hmm. you can, but don't put your faith in the political organization. Right. Um, you know, part of it is, you know, your view on what do you think, you know, government should be doing. Um, and that has nothing to do, I think, with your necessarily with your faith. Um, right. Where I think there are things, of course, is when you deal with stuff that is, you know, on moral grounds, such as abortion and other things. Um, but again, um, you know, all things being equal, um, yeah, that would be that would be a concern for me. But, you know, I, I sit back and I said, well, if I had somebody who claimed to be, you know, very pro-life, but uh, was going to vote for uh, Obamacare or something else. <laughs> excuse me. I couldn't get to my switch there. It's okay. um, you know, <laughs> could I could I vote for that person in good conscience? You know, I mean. Yeah, you know, well, yeah, you know, and that's the thing. I used to be. I used to be really black and white as far as um as far as how I voted um that well if if someone is I will only vote for pro life candidates and that kind of thing. But I've realized that for me the biggest um the biggest issue in, in politics today is not any of those things. It's the need for uh for election reform. Um because until because right now, if you want to get reelected, you've got to kowtow to the lobbyists or you won't have enough money to be reelected. If we could put spending caps on election campaigns, then um, then people could actually stand up for what they believe in. For right now, I'm, I'm kind of sympathetic to these guys that take money from lobbyists because I, I really feel like they don't have a choice. And that's just my opinion. But... Um, but you know it's just i think that that we've got you're not going to be able to to deal with some of these other issues until you have people that are actually able to vote their conscience so um and it's right now it's 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 this sort of party spirit you can't um you can't go against your party and you uh, you can't go against your lobbyists and and all that kind of stuff and and I just, um, I, I don't, I don't know that I've ever specifically voted for, uh, um, for a, a pro choice candidate. Um, but it's not a deal breaker for me anymore. I mean, personally, I'm definitely still very pro life. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and that's definitely an important issue for me. But if I think that if a if if a Democrat were to um to to like if his main platform were election reform and, and we're gonna really push for for cleaning this up, you know, I I would definitely hear him out. And, um, hey, well, if it's election reform, where would the money come from to to run then? Because he's not getting any of my money to run. That's the problem. Uh, <laughs> because you know, then you'll get any every time Dick and Harry running because they, you know, they all have a, a thing. 
No, see, when it comes to lobbyists, I just remember what one politician once said. There's a day that I can't take your money, eat your food, kiss your women, turn around and vote against you. I don't deserve to be called a politician. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I mean, that's how I, uh, I don't feel sorry for those guys. Come on, every one of them. They would number one to get the money from the lobbyists because they, they 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 have the same position. Number two, nobody's making them take this job. Uh, they're all choosing to run for it, um, well, even though it costs so much Feel money. sorry for them. I mean, given the severance packages or you know retirement packages and stuff these guys have. When I said feel sorry for them, I just you know they're they're under a lot of pressure. They're in this bind. Yeah, they knew what they were getting into. But yeah, I just, and they they get out. They 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 become lobbyists themselves. So yeah. you know, I still think uh, that it would drastically improve the. Um, the situation. Yeah, they, 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 you know, as as one person once said, you know, there's, 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 you know, ten percent of the people out there are saying, "How can I help others?" Uh, the other ninety percent are looking at it, going, "What's in this for me?" And uh, you know, that's that's just the way that, that they these these politicians get to be. I just very cynical. Um, have I voted for uh, 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 pro-choice politicians? Yes, I have. They called governors of Massachusetts, but, you know, I had my buddy between, you know, uh, De- Deval Patrick together we can and, uh, you know, good old Muffy on the Republican side, you know, so I couldn't, you know, you know, together we can, you know, run Massachusetts in the ground so far. Well, that's what every guy does in Massachusetts. What am I talking about? <laughs> that's just the nature, you know, that's just that's the nature of the corruption in the state. So, uh, you know. I mean, they think Chicago's bad, man. They haven't lived in Massachusetts. <laughs> it's a whole state that way. But, you know, it's, uh, I don't know. I, but I think, you know, trying to, you know, reach out, deal with faith issues is important. And I am glad uh, they brought this, this issue up. If nothing else, just even if you're not going to necessarily sort of cater to a particular group, um, but just to, to listen to people's positions. And, you know, and, and, and hear them out and, and find out, you know, get your finger on their pulse. You know, hopefully you can at least at that point better represent your constituents, if nothing else. Mm-hmm. So. Um, we had some listener mail, didn't we? Yeah, we did. There's a comment on YouTube from Romania. It says, uh, this was back on talking about episode 77, which has actually wow. been one of our more popular episodes, um, specifically with people in Romania. And which one was that? That was the one where they had that, that Romanian cleric that was the, it was the title was that's one scary dude. And it was that guy that had like you just look at him, he had this big old beard and, and stuff and and uh and he just looked like a I don't know, like a biker gang guy mm. or something like that. It was I mean it was really not the sort of thing that, that most of um you know Westerners think of when you know when you say a, a religious cleric. Um and uh and I think it was like exorcisms or something like that. Um but he says uh let me tell you something about Romanian religion. It's exactly like the one in Middle Age. Nothing has changed. I know that guy from TV. Believe me, his thoughts, uh, his thoughts and mine is like a 1500 to 1600 medieval priest. Believe me, I live there. Sorry about the English. <laughs> Good on you, mate. So, so, I mean, you know, that's that's interesting. The and that's the thing about. Um, about a lot of Eastern Orthodox, they, uh, especially in in certain parts of the world, they haven't really changed a whole lot, you know, in in hundreds of years. So whether that's good or bad, I don't know. Sometimes that's a good thing. <laughs> um, but uh, really appreciate the comment. It's always cool to you know to get comments from. Um, it, it, I find it interesting that people watch this that um, that aren't native English speakers. Uh, which we have quite I'm a few. I'm surprised somebody watches it at all. So. Yeah. <laughs> Other than, of course, people Dale, you know, pays to, to watch this show. <laughs> hey, everybody. God bless. 
Uh, Lord, watch over you this week. Hope you had a joyous today as today was the festival of the Holy Trinity. Yep. Hope you uh, used the Athanasian Creed. We did in our first service this morning. Yep. So, uh, and then God gave an explanation at the end of the service for that last line about uh, those who have done good and, and those who have done evil. I mean, no, I didn't do that. But. No, I do. I always do it during the announcements after the service. I always go, all right, I better explain that one because you're probably wondering. <laughs> I used to put a footnote in. I might go back to that. So, okay. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> thanks everybody for tuning in we'd love your feedback podcast at crossfeednews.com we'd like to uh, to hear from you on on any of the stories we talked about tonight so good night everybody god bless good night god bless